So good yep. evening, everyone. Welcome to our Java user group event with um, Kevin Vitek, um, and he will talk about test containers, the past, the present, and the future. And before we start with his presentation, I will actually share some details about the platform. You probably know that already, but if you don't, I just um, explain it to you. So um, Big Marker is our online format right now. So if you have missed like a previous ta talk or you will miss one in the future, we will also um, publish it to YouTube. So we have our own YouTube channel where you can subscribe and also press the, the bell button, of course, to get notified if something new is published. Usually Marcus behind the scenes is really fast with publishing this. So usually like within one or two days, the talks are already um, there. So that's actually quite nice. Um, today we have the chance to talk in the chat, but beside that, we also have our own Slack channel. And personally, I found out um, last Friday when we had a talk with Heinz Kabutz that it's actually quite helpful if you cannot even join the, the Big Marker um, channel that you can write in the chat and we are monitoring that, helping you to get into it. So if there is a problem, and you may not know that in the future that things are going wrong or so, just get in touch with us through the Slack channel. That helps a lot. And also we will publish there also upcoming um, talks. So just like our channels. At the end, you will get forwarded automatically to a feedback form. So this is actually very valuable for us and that we have feedback from you and we can actually improve. And as we do, like every month, we um, make a draw and you can win an IntelliJ IDEA license if you want, right? So that's also a, a nice thing we can provide to you. Uh, be aware of that we have some 15 seconds delay. Sometimes it's a bit more. And this makes things not so interactive. So there might be some weird situations. Just please bear with us while we are waiting for your answers especially if you build in some interactions like polls and so on. We have a chat. As you used it already, say hello, ask questions. Also, if you have technical issues, let us know there. If you have questions, please put it into the Q&A part because that's important so we can keep track of all the questions. I will ask Kevin during the talk or maybe afterwards, depending where the questions fits better, uh, I will ask him directly. So let me know if I need to disturb him during the talk with some questions. Use the Q&A part here. And then actually we will send out also at the beginning some polls. That means you will be able to press yes or no or some usual other answers. And so we get a feeling about you and the particular topic. Right, so you will get automatically a notification, a pop-up, and you have to press a button. If you don't, it just goes away a few seconds later. Um, I'm really happy to have now Kevin here. Um, Kevin is a person I met at the uh, J Alba conference, I think two or three years ago. And he was uh, an interesting guy because he, he explained us the, the test containers thing and so on, and also what else he does um, beside that, because he's really like into rock music and this is um, really, really nice. And what we were chatting about just like a few minutes before, he also explained us that he will become like a blockchain doctor. So if you want to have your blockchain fixed, he can help you because he's like a person who really understands everything. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> that's really cool, right? So yeah, getting a, a doctor um, on blockchains. And um, yeah, I just will um, yeah provide you the stage, Kevin. And I'm sure if you want to say something more about you, it's better you do it yourself. So it's your turn. I'm really interested in your topic. Test containers, yes. past, the present, and the future. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Yes, I was also thinking how we first met at Gialba and I kind of remember uh, us sitting at the whiskey tasting session or so in the evening. It was really, really cool conference. Yes, I hope it can happen again in the in the future at one point. Definitely. So I'm sh sharing this 
the screen now. All right. Okay. Okay, yes. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. Uh, very happy to uh, be here at the um, Java User Group Switzerland. Um, yes, your Java User Group Switzerland. And um, I will talk to you about test containers. And before we start, I think we will, can we shoot out the polls or do I have to click something? So just shoot out both polls. Uh, yes, so I just, uh, say do it later on mine and um, then then I kind of get a feeling where all of you are standing with regards to test containers and I have a better feeling where I have to add some details or or not so uh, yes one two more sentences about myself In, indeed I switched to academia uh, last year last year in summer and now I'm doing my PhD in the topic of blockchain, or if you want to be more generic, you can say on the field of distributed uh, systems engineering. And um, I'm leading the blockchain research lab at the Institute for Internet Security in uh, Gelsenkirchen in Germany and doing my PhD at the RWTH Aachen. Um, yeah, and ah, the results come in and um, um, in, in addition, I'm also a um, consultant coach on the, on the side, and I'm one of the maintainers of test containers and in general, a, a big fan of open source as a community and as a methodology. And um, I have a couple of, of blockchain activities where I'm more involved in nowadays. This is a, a Bloxberg, which is a scientific a blockchain platform. Um, for scientific use cases and run by universities and research organizations worldwide. And Sovereign is actually the biggest um, self-sovereign identity network, which is a use case where blockchain is also used. Uh, and I'm an Oracle Groundbreaker ambassador. Before I go on, let me quickly switch the screen to here. Uh, wait, I will move some things around. So yeah, that's, that's a bit better for me because else I have to look to the side, it's not so perfect. Um, yes, and you also still see everything. All right, so uh, first of all, thanks a lot to Sergey, uh, Sergey Ogorov, one of the other test containers maintainer because he had the original idea for a talk like this. He gave in another conference and I just stole his idea. <laughs> give a similar talk now. So I have to thank him for having the idea and also for providing some of the slides and some of the concepts. Um, yes, so uh, I'm checking, uh, do you know test containers? Oh, actually many do not know. So more than half don't know test containers, but some do and some uh, use. So this means I will also add some content, some parts, explaining you what is test containers and not just do the deep dive, also trying to give you an overview. Um, so what I uh, what I like to explore one anecdote with regards to testing is an uh, anecdote that is super famous in Germany. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's famous everywhere in the world and it is, now you don't, should not see the title, it is this event. Um, it is about the Ariane 5 uh, collaboration, German, Fran France uh, collaboration uh, rocket. And um, yeah, it was an upgrade to the Ariane 4. And in the first start, I think it was the first start, it uh, exploded after a couple of seconds. And, and in German computer science education, this is really used as an uh, example for um, for a catastrophic software project failure, so to say. And why did it explode? Uh, so there was a inquiry afterwards and they found out that, so they ported a part of the software from the old Ariane 5 to the Ariane 5, for, uh, from the old Ariane 4 to the Ariane 5. And um, one, one component from the navigation system um, was before uh, receiving a 16-4-bit floating point a variable or value and it changed in the new version to be a 16-bit signed integer and then some sensors put out data that didn't fit the range of this variable it led to an overflow and then actually not the overflow was misinterpreted but there was an exception thrown by the um, 
by the program. It was uh, developed in Ada, which is, I think, like liked in in aerospace and uh, like uh, rocket science and so on. But uh, they didn't handle the exception. And then what happened? This navigational system turned off, or the sensor system turned off. And then from then on, um, the uh, rocket wasn't getting any more sense or input data. It was kind of flying blind. And then it thought it had a completely different direction. And then these thrusters started moving into different direction. And it just exploded. Yeah. And then they went into this inquiry. And then they came up with a couple of recommendations. And it's kind of interesting to find these recommendations they come up with. So we always, so sometimes we say like computer software or software engineering, it's not rocket science or whatever. So this is rocket science here. And in rocket science, they determined after this rocket exploded um, that it is good if there is basically test data specification and test requirements and things like test coverage for the equipment and so on. Um, software testing and so on. So they came up that it might be a better thing for the rocket science for <laughs> development of spacecraft to include testing and software testing into the process. Um, that is quite interesting. So indeed, they would have found this bug if they would have tested the software with realistic input data, which they didn't do. So um, just I don't know. For me, it's interesting. We always think that certain industries, certain fields should be very professional in the way they work with regards to their engineering. Um, but it's may maybe it's the same everywhere to a certain degree. But still, we can le learn from this that good testing can help us to avoid such catastrophic failures. And I have a small anecdote from myself when... Uh, I had to patch a, a Java EE application by going into a farm and updating the server that was standing inside the, the cow shack, basically. And this also happened because we had a, had a bug in a SQL statement, basically. It was kind of an off by one error. Uh, we were back then, we were programming a milking, so a software for milking robots but not the software that runs on the robot itself, but the software that was running on kind of a management surf, uh, server that would control the business logic. And the robot would uh, send a request to the server and ask how much food should the cow get? How much milk should I get out from the cow? And, and there was quite some complex business logic involved in determining this kind of food, how much milk to get, etc. And um, there was an off by one error, more or less, in the SQL statement. And therefore, it always looked as if the cow didn't eat anything in the previous visit and always get the maximum amount of food. So this was the bug. And it was kind of discovered in production because suddenly the cows were getting a lot of food and the food was getting empty. And then we had to debug it. And debugging it was, in this case, really, you were standing in, an, uh, in, a, in a machine hall in a big workshop with the robots being super loud everywhere. And you were connected with a laptop via SSH to the robot, looking into the logs, what was happening. And you would see, ah, OK, this here, off by one. And uh, of course, we could have found this with, with tests before. And we had tests, quite a lot of tests, but uh, a lot of unit tests, actually. And this um, error, the location of this error was at the integration part because it was at the integration to the database. And what I want to say with this is if you have a lot of code that integrates in ways with external components that the logic and the business logic becomes part of this external component, it can very often be better to use integration tests instead of unit tests. And um, this is the classics of the pyramid. We all learned at one point maybe in our career that uh, a perfect test you should look like this with a lot of unit tests, automated unit tests, then some integration tests. We can also give them different names like component tests, API tests, but most of all, we just call them integration tests, those in the middle. And then a couple of UI tests, also automated like Selenium or something, and then some session-based explorative testing. So this pyramid is 
kind of an historic ideal shape. And to be honest, I was still too lazy to look up where it first occurs, but I heard it happened, it occurred in a book called um, Agile Agile Testing or Agile Software Testing, some name, some, some name like this, something from the 90s. And um, there was, of course, a reason why in the 90s or in the beginning of the 2000s, this was the ideal shape because integration tests were expensive. They were maybe flaky, not stable. Unit tests were very fast. They were easy to write, easy to execute. So that's why the pyramid has the shape as it has. But maybe today we have tools and different hardware that can potentially allow different shapes as well. Like, for example, this shape, which looks like a honeycomb. I also heard it uh, referenced as a diamond shape. And this is from a blog post from 2018 from Spotify, where they explain how the test suit shape, uh, how the test suit of their microservices is shaped. And they say it's like a honeycomb. So there is a little bit of implementation detail, which are the unit tests. And then they have a lot of integration tests. And then they have a couple of integrated tests, integrated tests being an anti-pattern, which they then also define what an integrated test is. So normally I would now, if I would have a real life audience and we could have fast feedback with each other, I would ask the folks, um, who of you have ever heard of integrated tests? And mostly people have not. And I haven't heard about them before either, before reading this blog post. But I think they are a very useful concept and it makes sense to discuss them. And uh, yes, I will discuss it on the next slide. So um, maybe one more thing before. Spotify say their test suite looks like this. And it's mostly backed by test containers. At least it was the case in 2018, which was pretty cool. And they say the reason is because their microservices have a considerably higher integration surface. Therefore, it is more or less logical that in proportion, the amount of integration tests is also higher. At the same time, the integration tests have a certain black boxiness to them, which means they are ideally lo more loosely coupled to the actual implementation code. So therefore, having more integration tests instead of unit tests that, for example, make heavy use of mocking and stubbing, allows them to be more extreme with their, with their refactoring approaches. And I think this is uh, a valid point for them and their code base, obviously. So for the integrated tests, what are these integrated tests? They were first mentioned in an even older blog post by J.B. Rainsberger from the Agile community or TDD community. And he first had the um, blog post called Why Integration Tests Are a Scam. And then some people said like, oh, no, it's unfair what you're saying. You're not talking about good integration tests. You're talking about a special class of integration tests that are not good. Then he said like, oh, yeah, you're right. Actually, what I'm talking about is integrated tests. And then therefore now this blog post kind of is a definition of integrated tests, which is as follows. I use the term integrated test to meet any test whose result, pass or fail, depends on the correctness of the implementation of more than one piece of non-trivial behavior. So we don't want those tests because those tests is, as Spotify says, a test that will pass or fail based on the correctness of another system. These tests are terrible because if they fail, you don't know if it is your fault, if it is a fault of you changing your code, or if it is a fault of the other system that changed its shape, its behavior in a certain way. And to come up with some examples for integrated tests, we have an uh, integrated test in that moment where it is required from us to spin up or install or configure local services for testing. Like if you install a local or have to set up a local Postgres database to run your integration test, in this moment you have an integrated test because now your test will fail if you fail to set up the database before or if the database is set up incorrectly. Uh, yes, there are some comments about the pyramid. 
but I'm not sure if this is now disagreeing or agreeing with me. Uh, but the, the comment is valid, whatever. So, um, yeah, so this is an integrated test. Another integrated test is if you test against other services in a shared testing environment. This is a very classic example if you have, for example, a shared database, a shared mainframe database, etc. And there you can run in those circumstances where changes or test execution by another team can lead to your tests, for example, failing. So if you have not strongly isolated test environments, this can, um, yes, easily then break your test. And then you run into these situations where, I don't know, every other Friday your tests fail because the other team is doing certain stuff in this environment. And then what happens is that you become more or less blind of the test failures because you assume them to happen. And this means you're not trusting the correctness of your test suit anymore. And the other way around also holds true. If changes to your system break the tests of other systems, which also happens mostly if you have a shared environment where everyone deploys the current version of the software, whatever, everything, everything that's always tested in conjunction with each other. Here you have the integrated tests to the other side. So um, if we look a little bit at the tooling side of things with regards to test containers, um, we can see certain software tools emerging that potentially help us in either writing better integration tests or reducing the need for integration tests. And um, of course, one classic example is mocking and stubbing. And this was especially extremely useful or still very useful when it's too expensive to test against a real outside component. And then at a certain point, it became more or less easily possible to run local databases. And, and databases are really a, a very prominent integration point for a lot of application kinds, styles. And um, then we had local replacement databases, something like H2 or the Derby or whatever, which more or less tries to mimic the behavior of the real database because then uh, it's often still not possible to run an Oracle application cluster uh, locally, database locally. Um, so it was still trying to become closer to the real external integration points, but not really there. And then virtual machines and the possibility to instrument virtual machines unlocked a little bit new patterns of having more or less defined test environment. And Vagrant is a very good example for this. And I think Vagrant is a good tool. And especially at this time was a very good tool to, um, to describe and, and spin up and test and development environment. Um, but of course, it's a and it follows a certain infrastructure as code approach, but it, uh, there's a certain pain involved with instrumenting virtual machines. They are more or less expensive. And that's where Docker comes in and where Docker changed some paradigms that are possible for us now. Because creating Docker containers is nothing than a user space process with its own isolated file system. Now it became very easy, very cheap to spin up other applications that are more or less isolated and to spin up the whole environment that works for our test. But interacting directly with the Docker command line interface had some drawbacks. And then we had FIG, which later became Docker Compose, which was already a very good way to define those environments and share them in the team. And um, I, would, I would say currently we are one step further either, even with um, libraries interacting directly with the Docker API to allow for a tighter integration with your testing actually. And test containers does, does it like this. It's interacting directly with the Docker API. So yes, since a lot of you didn't know test containers yet, uh, ah, someone asks, uh, would a test involving an H2 in memory database considered to be an integrated test? Um, I would say an H2 in memory database is an integration test. Yes, I would say this is an integration test, but it depending on where later you are running your actual code, 
it is an integration test that maybe gives you less reliable answers. But this really depends on your SQL code, how portable it is. But especially if you have to run them in those compatibility modes, once you are in this domain, I have the feeling uh, they don't give you that robust answers about the correctness of your code anymore. And um, what is kind of painful is when you have to start um, managing two different sets of SQL statements or so, or SQL schema, because H2 has some limitations with regards to its features, syntax, etc. This is an area where I then become not so comfortable with H2. Yes, so test containers. Um, if we check the API, the, the direct Java API, it looks like this. Ah, Ebon, perfect example. So uh, thank you for this, for this comment. Uh, that is actually one of the examples I'm using in my test containers workshop, where I, I write some specific uh, um, SQL that, that doesn't really work with H2. And then it uh, kind of produces a wrong error. And then using test containers shows the code actually works. But your example is even better. Um, Yeah, so if you find like real production bug like this, that is uh, that is the dream. That's <laughs> that's what what we are doing test containers for. So very very happy if this worked for you. That's exactly the area where we where we aim at. So here you see an uh, the the vanilla API, the direct API for integration with test containers from your Java code, and in this way. Test containers is just an object-oriented API, uh, API for Docker or object-oriented library for Docker. And you can instantiate uh, your containers. You specify a Docker image with a tag. You can configure it with this uh, setters, with like setters, fluent setters. And then you can start it and then you can do stuff with it. Then you can stop it. And this starting already has some pretty cool stuff happening underneath because this is a blocking call that will actually wait for the application inside the container to be ready. So normally when you create a container, creating the container finishes as soon as the container is instantiated and the process is running. But Docker itself doesn't have directly any awareness about what readiness of an application means. And test containers provides different weight strategies that can be configured for a container. And the uh, Java code will basically wait at this point with the execution until the weight strategy is fulfilled. In this case, there is an implicit weight strategy that just waits that uh, TCP connection to this port can be opened. But there are more complex ones like checking for a certain HTTP answer. It's also possible to check for Docker health check or checking for a log, log message. It's also possible to check for JDBC statement even. Yeah. And then you can stop it once you're done and then it gets removed automatically and everything gets cleaned up by test containers automatically. So some words about the project. The first version of test containers Java was released in 2015 by Richard North here. And it's 100% open source under MIT license and more than 65 releases nowadays. A lot of outside contributors, but we have three main maintainers, the core maintainers, which is Richard, then Sergey, and me. I, I joined last. I first um, developed the test container Spock integration extension, and then later I joined the core team. And we have also forks in different languages. Um, those forks are maintained and developed by completely different people. We don't have an overlap between the people. We also don't have an overlap of the code bases. So they follow the same idea, but are their own implementation. I know the test containers Go version is quite popular in certain Go circles and um, 
also used in production like settings uh, for for the testing um, the others i can't really comment on the on the quality or the maturity of them test containers java is completely mature we saw before support for generic docker uh, images and containers and then there is also specialized support for special classes of application and special docker images for databases, we provide special classes that then have those weight strategies already configured, have some uh, quality of life APIs that make some things easier. And we have many other things like Kafka, Selenium support, uh, Docker Compose support, which is quite nice if you're already using Docker Compose, then you can just uh, point it to your existing Compose and it will then instrument the Docker Compose containers, basically. Um, and we also have support for cows testing with toxi proxy, where you can then put this toxi proxy between your application and the component your integration testing again, then can simulate drop packages in the network and so on. And um, with regards to its more core features, uh, one is the, uh, yes, dynamic port binding, but actually it's just using the Docker existing Docker feature of port publishing. So in Docker, if you don't bind, um, let me maybe switch quickly to here. So you now see my terminal down here. So in Docker, if you a docker run okay. uh, which is the port of doesn't doesn't matter let's do a uh, for the HTTPD um, so if we run it like this for Apache and like just say publish instead of port mapping. So I could also instead say, of course, something like this map 80 to 80, but that's not what we're doing. We are publishing port 80 and then um, Docker will automatically publish this port to a free ephemeral port on your system. Normally something about uh, above 32,000 depends on your kernel configuration. And yes, that's all what Test Containers does. But then Test Containers provides an API to get the map port, which you can then put into your system under test. And this is a very good thing because if you would do this fixed port binding, you would, by definition, already have an integrated test because now your test would fail if this port is blocked by another service. So um, yes, something I can very much recommend, always use this dynamic port mapping and don't uh, expect things to run on fixed ports and it should always be possible in your code base and in your test code base to cater for this fact that the um, port gets determined after the application started after the container started let me delete those things here switch back okay the way strategies I already mentioned this uh, test containers will block until the application inside the containers actually ready and then test containers out of the box performs a docker environment discovery uh, checking which kind of docker is actually running is it on linux is it on, on mac on windows is it using docker machine or a or a environment variable based based configuration and um, it determines this itself and works out of the box kind of plug and play like and because of this it's also easily platform independent and even on windows 10 for quite some time now actually and there with named pipe support uh, yes, works on Windows. It's very good. I'm actually running now on Windows. I switched to Windows after WSL2 was released, and I'm surprisingly happy. I used to be a hardcore Linux guy. 
and I still love Linux, but um, it became pretty good with WSL2. And Docker for Windows with WSL2 backend is really, really good. Yes, uh, works with the new JDKs. JDK 15 was released today, I think. So it should also work. We are not really perfectly working with the uh, module paths because um, we are idea sucks in WSL. Um, yeah, so I'm not running idea in WSL. I'm running idea in Windows and using the WSL then mostly as a Docker backend. Yeah, so that's true. If uh, IntelliJ would have an integration similar to VS Code, I, which I hope comes soon, it would be like the last missing point because then I could also use SDK man in WSL2. Yeah, that would be much cooler. Mm, yeah, so I said module pass, uh, your mileage may vary. Um, a lot of projects using test containers, a lot of open source project, also commercial companies, um, but we have, for example, Spring. Spring Data uses test containers for tests, for its internal testing, which is cool. Many different Apache projects using it, and yes, quite happy with this. Um, so, also we have different integration points. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Um, so you've seen before this kind of vanilla integration where you have to manage the container lifecycle yourself, but you can also plug it into your test framework. This is the Spock extension, which then will automatically start and stop containers uh, that are fields in your test classes. And um, we have the same thing for JUnit that is based on JUnit rules. And we have the same thing for JUnit Jupyter and which also works for nested uh, con nested test classes but um, it's it's not really a requirement to use this test framework extensions and actually re recon recommend for many use cases that it's uh, it can be better to manually control the life cycle manually from your code because um, it might be more efficient much more efficient actually to use something we call singleton container pattern, where you just once start the containers for your whole test suite and then let them running until the JVM exits. And then they get cleaned up automatically. This will in general speed up um, test time considerably. But then you have to take care of test pollution. So instead of having a new database uh, every test, you then have to clean up somehow, whatever. Um, yeah, so, uh, Philip, I know there is an open issue for WSL2 integration. Uh, I don't think it's, it's not there yet, uh, but something will come and maybe in non IntelliJ versions, they have it. I could imagine like PyCharm maybe has it perfectly and IntelliJ has not because for example, PyCharm had an, in, had a perfect. Uh, integration with Docker images as uh, interpreters, basically, as the build environments. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, here we see uh, the uh, development of the stars. So now it's over 4,000 stars we have, which is pretty, pretty, pretty good for a Java project. It's, of course, nothing compared to JavaScript project, but for, for a Java project, it's pretty cool. And uh, we can we can check some easy examples, and then I would actually start some deep diving into features we um, developed in the last year years coming up. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Um, so when you want to get started with test containers, all you need is the Maven dependency or here I have Gradle, but, but you know, it's the same. And, um, we have this bill of material you can include, then you can omit the version of, for the different modules because each, each specific module is its own artifact. 
but the bill of materials is not that required as for example as for a spring boot project because it will just add this version everywhere um yes and we have a stupid example application that is by design free of any um, framework stuff and so on so we just have a java book class that can be saved in a book repository which is an abstraction over a jdbc data source so over a relational database and has a couple of methods saving books counting books searching by author and then everything with with java sql classes so kind of vanilla java then we have an additional class here for sending out messages special offers uh, onto a kafka topic so this actually does nothing if you check this method which we want to test send notification it does nothing but but send strings on a kafka topic but still we want to integration test now those classes and let's check the yes so <clears throat> Here I'm using the JUnit Jupyter integration. You see it's annotated with S test containers. I define here a Postgres uh, object. <clears throat> and um, this is now like a specialized module. I'm not using generic container here, but Postgres uh, module that already has the Sway strategy correctly configured and so on. Is annotated with add containers it means it's managed by the test containers extension and here we see some of the quality of life apis we get from using the specialized uh, containers like this get jdbc url which will automatically get you the jdbc url containing the dynamically mapped port if we look into the implementation it's actually quite simple what is happening here it is um just constructing this jdbc url from the container ip address and from the map port and this get container ip address will return the ip address under which the map port is um, reachable so it will not actually return the containers ip address still you should use this method if so if you if you use generic container you don't have this get jdbc url you have to construct this url yourself you should use this method get container ip address because this makes the test automatically portable because you don't necessarily know if docker will always run or always be accessible on local host for example in ci it might run on a different server and then by using this get container ip address approach it will automatically work and becomes nicely portable I'm just using Flyway here to uh, set up an initial um, database schema. And then I have a couple of tests. Empty repository is empty. We have one book after saving it and we can search for books. And I will run this now. And the way this is configured here will spin up a new Postgres database container for each test method. Yep, so we see it's running now. We see some log output. Container is starting and some things happening. Okay, first test is through. Container gets thrown away. Next test, container gets started. Test is run and again for the last test. And um, yeah, this is this worked fine. Of course, it was now considerably expensive, taking 20 seconds and using H2 in memory database would be much cheaper. However, you get a real Postgres database here you can test against. And by using more clever ways to set up your test environment, you can save a lot of time. So instead of using the, a new um, container for each method, we can start by using the same container for all tests in this class, at least, that already helps. And now instead of solving test pollution on the infrastructure level, we solve it on the logical level by just doing here a flyway clean. And I now just have the initial overhead of starting the container, which still is there, initial overhead is there. 
but then the rest is considerably faster, of course. So it's already good. And when you use the singleton container pattern, which I will just share the, the link to, it becomes even, even better. So I'm sharing the link here. This is our favorite way to integrate test containers, actually. The singleton container pattern, I, I shared the link. So, yes, we saw the, the Postgres version uh, integration. Now with Kafka, it's actually very, very similar. We have the Kafka is also a special module here. And then we have a test that just um, uses a special offer notifier object. It is when constructing this object, doing constructor dependency injection of the um, dynamic URL. This is something you should keep in mind to have your code easily testable. You should have some way to, in a controlled fashion, specify those URLs at test runtime. So what doesn't work with test containers is having static configuration files that contain those URLs to the test environments anymore. It has to happen as part of the test execution. And constructor dependency injection, which just means having it as an argument in the constructor works pretty well as a pattern for this. Okay, and if we run this, we can at the same time check at the terminal, watch Docker PS. <clears throat> we see some containers, we should see some containers popping up. So Kafka container popped up here and this additional Rio container, which is a helper container from test containers and it is used to clean up the test containers resources after tests and after the JVM exits. So even if the JVM crashes, it's still okay. The Rio container will then clean up everything. Good, so this is just the, the basic peek into test containers and I don't want to show like all the features of test containers here now, I want to more quickly glance over all the new features that came in the last months because this is kind of the idea of the talk to give you some insights into this and also in the in the future developments of test containers and what we have coming up. Kevin, we have a few questions as well. I think maybe it's a good oh. idea to answer them. Yes, yes, very good. So I can read it for you. Can you compare test containers to Arquilian Cube? Yeah, it is. Um... I never have used Aquilion Cube myself, but it is in certain ways similar. And I think later versions of Aquilion or Aquilion Cube, yes, they do exactly this, like kind of replacing Docker Compose and setting up those things. So I would say it's fundamentally the same idea, but as far as I know, and I don't want to offend anyone, but as far as I know, Aquilion Cube is basically dead and not really actively maintained anymore. Um, if someone has another experience, please share them. But that is my last uh, knowledge I had. And as far as I know, even users of Aquilion Cube were recommended to migrate to test containers. Okay. I don't want to offend anyone, but I think it's, it's like this. Yes. Then let's go with the next one. Magdalena asks, as I understand, test containers depends on JUnit 4 test rule internally. Is the only thing that brings JUnit 4 dependency into your project? Any plans to switch to JUnit 5? Yes, I will have an exactly slide about this problem later. <laughs> then I will expand on this. <laughs> okay, so we'll mark it answered later. Yes. Then Luca was asking, um, for which technologies um, do these container classes exist in the Java implementation? He mentioned Kafka, Postgres, what else? Yeah, so the easiest way to check this, and it's also the way I would recommend to use for checking. Let me share the slide screen. Uh, here. Okay. Yeah, okay. So the easiest way to check supported modules is by so you can either check here in the official documentation of test containers org under modules you can find quite 
some different ones and some are wrapped like under database you find all the different databases but what is sometimes even better is going into the github and checking under modules what you can find here because there might be instances where maybe someone didn't provide documentation to here but we still have the module here so either one of those two uh, you can check out and so you see we have many relational and NoSQL databases, Kafka, Elasticsearch, Engines, which is super useless, like it would also work with generic container. Um, yeah, so, and, and this web driver container is cool because it wraps Selenium in the browser. In general, what I really want to emphasize is if you have a technology in use as a Docker container and that is not supported by a test containers module, it doesn't mean you can't use test containers. You can most of the time just use generic container and configure it correctly and it works perfectly. It depends on how good the Docker image is. The better the Docker image, the less the requirement or the need for an actual specific module implementation. And um, yes, you can also always implement your own kind of classes as part of your your own code and extend just generic container and make your own specific container. And this is sometimes also the case, I think, when there is like a new major version of a product, like a database or so, that the first way to go would be like with the generic container until they, they change the integration module afterwards, right? Yes, so, so I think there, there were some problems with MySQL at one point that the image was not working, like the modern image of the version was not working directly with our container class implementation. A similar thing with Oracle. And this is because test containers makes a lot of implicit assumption about how the container will look or how the image looks. Like we check certain locks for the weight strategies, for example, like bad integration points, but we don't have cleaner ones because the images don't have cleaner ones. And uh, yes, therefore this, this can sometimes break and then you can just roll your own. It should not block you actually. Okay, so Werner is asking when running Docker builder images on a CI server with Docker in Docker and a custom network for Docker, is test container still always mapping the ports to the Docker host or can the custom network be passed into test containers? So networking between the test containers, use the host name and ports within the custom network or is that external mapping done in any case? So amazingly, I understood the question perfectly. And yes, you can pass in the network. Um, let me show you. Uh, is it here or let me, so we have a actually good working search here. So we have networking and communicating with containers. I'm not sure if we have a documentation about this advanced networking. Uh, no, let me show switch my screen to the IDE. You can say with, so we have this networks in test containers, which is an abstraction over Docker networks. So then you could say here with network something and now let me let me try something network point. So let's see what builder do. Um, how was it? Network. Yes, network. One second. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm currently not sure if there's a cleaner API, but I know this way it works. Um, so it's basically, we have this network class, which is more or less supposed to be used for creating network. And you can do network, new network, and then you get a new network, and then you can give it whatever name. My network, oopsie, like this. And then you can say on Kafka with network 
my network and then it gets put on the Docker network. So now how I understood you, Werner, you already have a Docker network. So in this case, the network has an ID and you just can create a new um, Docker network object like by overriding the interface. I'm, I'm not sure right now if we have a cleaner API for this. So we have this builder thingy, but I'm, I'm not sure what it does. Network impl builder. So this stuff also, network impl builder. I, I'm not 100% sure. There might be another way, whatever. What has to happen is that you have a network object that has the ID of your network ID. And if you will use this, it will put it on the same network and then you can, of course, use the Docker DNS feature. Yes. Uh, you can, if you try it out and you have problems, you can uh, write me on Twitter or whatever, and I also can have a look. Good, so let's ask some Joanne's questions. How would you test components that are supposed to run on a JE application server? Um, there is a project that let me now switch to the other window problem is i don't have the what is the what is the name there is this project from the ibm je people that uses test containers for exactly this ah oh. Test containers, JE, test inch or something. Ah, sorry, I don't have the name right now. IBM. Oh, from the Open Liberty people. It is from the Open. Yes, and Andy, Andy, Andy builds this. Uh, so if we kind of follow him here, Microshed, very good. So Microshed is a testing framework that builds on top of test containers and that has a tighter integration with JEE. So I'm not a big JEE expert, so I can't comment on the details, but you could definitely use this uh, as an alternative. What I did before, what also works is building your uh, JEE application as a Docker image and then putting this Docker image, instrumenting it with test containers and just doing black box testing against its APIs, against the REST API or so on. Yes. I think what MicroChat does, it uh, automatically generates client interfaces for the controllers and so on. I haven't really used it myself, but you can check it out. I will post the link in the chat. That's great. Thanks. And maybe then the last question um, I would now place here because you still have some slides. Um, yeah. My main problem um, was always the weight strategy to elect, for example, MySQL. Um, it looks like containers have improved health checks or the specific test containers have improved. So if there are flaky strategies, we of course try to solve them at a certain point in time. Um, which ones were flaky, Selenium and so on. Postgres was always flaky until we started using the log message based weight strategy. Um, there were some other flakiness problems um, that came from the Windows integration that we were sometimes missing log messages or there were characters in the log messages. Therefore, then sometimes web strategies would not hit. So definitely some things have improved on the test container side whenever we found a way to solve flakiness. Um, on the other hand, if an image provides Docker health check, you can use Docker health check integration or Docker health check way strategy. And in my opinion, this should be the cleanest way. However, the Docker images not always implement health check, sadly. Okay, thanks. So then let's just jump back to the presentation. Yes, so um, I will, I think, not go too much over all the past slides I have now in all the detail. I will jump quick through it, I think. And then 
talk a little bit more about some future things because there have also been questions about this and I think it's more interesting. And as you see, it starts very, very far in the past by now, so September 2018. But this was a super big release for test containers because it brought the native or really good native integration with Windows. This was test containers supporting name pipes on Windows. Before test containers was communicating or Docker Java was communicating with the Docker daemon over the TCP port. And for this to work, you had to set this checkbox in your Docker for Windows, expose daemon on TCP. And since this version 1.9, this is not necessary anymore. And this was the point where support of Windows really became great. And from that point on, I think test containers runs equally good on all the operation systems. Yeah, and now even with WSL2 Docker backend, it it's, runs perfect on Windows in my experience. So many, many stuff like new modules and so on, I'm not going into these details, you know. This is kind of cute, but also brings its problems. So we started to integrate Dependabot into uh, our GitHub repository. So Dependabot automatically opens pull requests for you for um, for libraries when there are new versions for your libraries, for your dependencies. But uh, especially if you don't auto merge them all the time, it creates a lot of noise in your pull requests and it really grinds down your energy. So you have to be careful with using Dependabot. Um, yeah, but you see it's super active, <laughs> super active. Yeah, so these things. I'm uh, now now we become a little bit more recent. Yeah, let's let's start talking about this stuff because here are some cool stuff in. Um, we have now R two DBC support for R two DBC URLs. This is the reactive uh, variant of JDBC, so to say. If you have a reactive connection to your to your database and um, they look like this, it seems. So I'm not that into this topic. And if you specify such an R2 DBC URL to connect to, then it will automatically spin up a test containers underneath. So this works very similar to how it would work for a H2 in memory database, where you also just have a special JDBC URL and it will automatically create the uh, database for you. It's the same here. We have your, our own database driver that is a proxy to the actual database driver that will then uh, handle the creation of the container. And this feature we have for a long time for, J2, for JDBC. Now it also is there for R2DBC. And then what also is cool is that in JUnit Jupyter and Spock, we now implement the test lifecycle aware interface what does this mean? This means if you use the um, browser web driver container, which has a feature for recording uh, a video of your Selenium tests, it is now able to only save, for example, failed tests. Um, yes, this is done via VNC, but it all works for you automatically. Yeah. Um, Yes, we are on finally, finally for our own images uh, now on Docker Hub on the official test containers group. So it took us forever to get the test containers namespace on Docker Hub because someone took it many years ago and we never got it. So we were always running around on Quayo. And in this time, there were this a lot of problems, a lot of downtimes with Quayo from Red Hat and then we said, okay, we will pull the trigger and we will just jump to Docker Hub. Of course, nowadays there are new developments with regards to Docker Hub and this limitations, this pull rate limiting and so on. So we will all have to see how this goes in the future. And this is now a quite exciting new release. That's not there yet, but that is upcoming. We released a release candidate version 1.5 release candidate, but yeah, let's assume this month or next month, we will also release a real 1.15 release. Um, we have a 
incubating or maybe already working support for running Docker in rootless mode, uh, which is a, a experimental feature of Docker. Then we try to clean up our constructors. So the new constructors look like this. We are not having this empty constructor that will just use some kind of image and we don't have this string constructor that sometimes would mean it's an image, sometimes it would mean it's in tag. So now we have a clear um, API that um, uses a Docker image name object that you can construct like this. And this is cleaner for everyone involved. And uh, so my wife wants something. No, 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 just no. No? Yeah. All good. Um, yeah, and also we have a new API that is also will come in the new version that will be more explicit about you uh, having to override if you use your own images. So you will have to say, okay, I will use an image, like my Postgres image is called Fuba, but uh, I still am aware it needs to be compatible with this image. So kind of making it more explicit to the user that test containers makes a lot of assumptions about the underlying images for it to work. So yes, this is kind of near past and what is cooking up. And uh, some other things to maybe keep in mind, or I just like to touch and expand on. One thing is that we uh, have this self-typing pattern. Um, it's called generic type with recursive type parameter pattern. So it looks like, like this, my class T extends my class T. We use this. Um, starting from generic container to allow subclassing while still allowing for this fluent builder style setters. So with, with exposed ports and so on, that the, they are uh, interchangeably be usable, we use this pattern for. But it's sometimes a bit awkward to use in Scala and Kotlin and new users are not really aware of this pattern. And in some modules we didn't use it, which is also a not cool. So I don't know, at one point, we will probably change our API with regards to this, um, probably to something that more looks like a builder pattern for constructing containers. And funnily enough, what would also be fo possible to for creating containers is using the double brace initialization pattern. And we once asked if we should use this on test uh, on on Twitter, and Brian Götz already said uh, so not, that we should not use it, and also that it's not called double brace, and it doesn't really exist as a feature. But still, uh, it looks like this, and it already works, and uh, everyone can use it like this if they want to. Um, yeah, so it's um, kind of what is it in actually? It's an anonymous class with a initializer block. What is this is this double brace initializer, but it allows you to be more flexible in the code here. And then you can write things like this, which are maybe nice for defining containers as fields. Um, yeah, so, and, but of course why people don't like it is because it pollutes the JVM with those anonymous classes. And I see this point if it's used in production code, for example, for uh, it's often misused for initializing hash maps. That's not a good thing, I agree, but I think for the tests, it's okay. You can do it if you want. <laughs> no one can stop you to do it. And um, yeah, in, in Kotlin, we have something that already supports this kind of pattern, in my opinion, very nicely with this apply function Then that gets a closure, or I don't know if it's called closure in, in uh, Kotlin, or just a function pointer, I don't know. But it's cool. And you can already use it like this if you're using test containers in Kotlin. And then another point is providing workflows that support more, more something like a TDD um, cycle. So we've seen even if we start the container and you reuse the same container for the whole test suite, there is a certain overhead with starting the container. And depending on the actual container and the actual image, 
the that overhead could be considerable. So we want to somehow help against this problem. But at the same time, we really, really want the test containers to be ephemeral, especially when you run your tests, just to be very sure that we're not having integrated test. So, yes. Um, and we have here Jens from Spring Data Team. That, and he says, for example, he's using uh, test containers for developing Spring Data, for example, integration with MS SQL. He says, okay, like if you want to do like this local flow that is more TDD like, you um, should not use test containers. You should comment it out and instead have a running instance. And I think this is a valid, valid point. And it's also a valid point to wanting to have a TDD like flow with a strong integration. Because if you're writing code that has a strong integration, like very SQL y code, then it's totally valid to have this flow. And uh, yeah, we have an incubating feature that allows this, and this is called reusable containers. Incubating alpha feature uh, for a, a too long time now incubating, I would say. But yeah, it's actually as an alpha feature in test containers for quite some time since version 1.12. And you can uh, enable it by setting in your test containers properties, test containers reuse enable. And then you have to express explicitly um, enable it at the container field. And it uses kind of, it hashes the container definition and uses this as a lookup key to see if there is still a container running it that can be reused. And we can check it out. I would if I still have my. Ah, yeah. So I have this book repository reusable test. And so what I have to do, I just have to say, okay, with reuse true, this means this container is potentially reusable. And then, as I said, I have to have this property set in my test containers properties file. And now if I run it the first time, we should see the um, container pop up. Did I run it? Oh, ah, yeah. Up this class, therefore it wasn't compiling anymore. All right, this was the first time, and now if we check in the terminal, um, we will now see the real container will turn off in a couple of seconds because the JVM exited, but the Postgres container keeps on running. Now, if I run it again, it should be faster than before. Actually, what takes most time is in the beginning, starting this Gradle process and so on. Yes. So yeah, that, that's it. Uh, and you can use it and there are some limitations and um, currently they will never get cleaned up but actually what we have to implement is kind of a of a of a of a freshness so that maybe after 20 minutes of not using them they get deleted or something like this but you can start using it and for local development purposes and so on and i think it serves its purpose for this specific use case already all 
All right. Mm, one second. Okay. Okay. Yes. Then some other things. Um, now it's becoming more or less a joke saying this, but we are working on test containers 2.0, but I probably said this already two years ago. So we are not really working on test containers 2.0, but we envision at one point that we will have a test containers 2.0 that involves some breaking changes, like having this different API and so on. Um, people always ask about Podman support, and I can just say we are not working on it from our side, but at one point, Red Hat started to make, te uh, make Podman with this Podman server proxy thingy a Docker replacement, and they use test containers to check if it's really a replacement, but it didn't work. And I think it, now it stopped. So no one of us will actively work towards Podman support. I think we can't bring this in. And we kind of have the opinion that if Podman wants to be a drop-in replacement for Docker, it should take care of being a drop-in replacement. It is not at the moment. Um, then we are working on uh, conceptually. We are working on something which will be called container core, which is then test framework agnostic. And then this will be completely detached from any JUnit 4 stuff. And it will be a, a test framework agnostic object oriented abstraction over do Docker containers. You can just use this new generic container and start and stop without any um, involvement in the test use case. Um, yes. And this is how the structure looks currently. So we have core and as Magdalena correctly said, core depends on JUnit 4, which is not ideal. Mm. And then we have the other modules and we have other test frameworks, which are just their own modules. So instead an architecture that would look much nicer would look something like this probably. So we have this container core and then we have integrations with different frameworks as, as modules and we have all these specific modules and we potentially could imagine different execution engines. So far we just have Docker, but this could maybe allow other ones. Yes. So this is a, a small anecdote on the side, which I will not dive into too much, but uh, basically Sergey from, from Test Containers is now also the maintainer of the Docker Java library, which is the main Docker library in the Java ecosystem. And Test Containers is a heavy user of Docker Java. There have been some problems with the previous maintainer, but they all have been sorted out. And now Sergey is the maintainer of it. And um, yeah, test containers is one of the main users. And we also try to move this in a in more uh, nicer direction maybe, but it's a lot of work and Sergey is doing um, his best, I think, to like also manage this big project now with a lot of prominent projects using it. Yeah, it's a lot of work, especially if you don't want to break functionality for your users. Um, Far future, maybe what can happen at some point in the future is a support for Windows containers on Windows. This would work out of the box at the point where Windows supports a hybrid mode that supports Linux containers and Windows containers at the same time, because the API is really the same. I tried out Windows containers with test containers, it works. Just the problem is we have our uh, uh, like sidecar containers, like the Ryuk, which are Linux containers. And we don't want to rebuild them as Windows containers. That's why we can't support it now. People are always asking for support for orchestrators, especially Kubernetes. Um, so this is not something we can provide. This is definitely something where we need outside collaborators or we need someone stepping in and maybe funding such a development because it's much too big for us to do it on the side. And sometimes I wonder if this is really the use case for test containers, like instrumenting stuff in Kubernetes. I, I'm not sure because test containers is more or less there to spin up local test and development environments for you. 
Yes, other container engines, I already mentioned it. I mentioned Podman, something like Firecracker might be cool. And um, yeah, going going further, if we have those cloud IDEs like Visual Studio Code remote development environment, GitHub code spaces and so on, um, if they become more prominent and they lead to you running your build already in a Docker container transparently, then some new nice patterns could be unlocked in test containers. So basically what I think it was Werner, that, that Werner, yes, that Werner asked before. So where you, um, instead of using this dynamic port mapping approach, just connect the stuff into your same Docker network and then you can statically interact or, or you have can have a static URL on which you uh, interact. And that would be cool once the builds run transparently in containers. Yes, so um, that's that's it from from my side. Um, we have a, a sponsorship GitHub sponsorship program now or for test containers. So if your company is a test containers user and you like what you're doing, maybe you can sponsor something. It's mainly there for helping our motivation right now, but we also have different tiers that would allow something like bug bounties and so on. So we are not interested in commercializing test containers, but we just see it becomes a lot of work to maintain it. And we just think about approaches to make it sustainable in the long term. And trying out GitHub sponsors is one approach now, one test. And yes, I have my own <laughs> GitHub sponsors, but I have no one sponsoring me. But if you like what I'm doing in the open source and blockchain world, you can maybe sponsor me also. And then I can get some coffee and some Bitcoin from it or Ether. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to um, go on discussing stuff with you and answer any other questions that come up. And yes. Thanks a lot for the presentation, Kevin. It's really like awesome stuff what you're doing. Um, I have also a question before we go to the Q&A and people are entering more questions actually. So we know that for example, an Oracle container is quite big. It's a, I think it's about 11 gigabyte or so. I don't yes. know exactly yes. how 11, it's yes. so big. So how can you improve their um, the the time actually when you execute such a test is there is this something you as a test container project and um, are also targeting this like the, the the ramp up period of of those containers or uh, was that the approach with the um, with the reusable containers so you could fix it or are do you have some other ideas around here? So the Oracle is really a, a good point because it's quite high on my to-do list actually tackling this Oracle one. So we used to have an Oracle module that was based on Oracle XE, uh, but it's terribly outdated and it was never using the official drivers, etc. Now Oracle has released their software under the OTN license that allows you to use it for development. That also allows it to use allows us to use it in our CI, etc. So that now allows us in general to support Oracle better. Now, the fact that the image is so big is the problem. And what is even the bigger problem is that if you follow the approach from Oracle of building the image, the startup time is 12 minutes or, or 10 minutes, the initialization time. Mm -hmm. So this is like not usable in my opinion. What you can do, however, is after you do this initial bootstrapping of the Oracle image, you can commit this layer and then the startup time becomes much uh, faster, uh, probably still maybe a minute or so, but not 10 minutes anymore. Um, this of course also creates a super big image, which is then, um, I think you can't go under 10 gigabyte probably. Now, if a big image is a problem for you or not, this is a different question because this depends on if you have the images all locally in your um, image layers, then it's not a real problem. It becomes a real problem if you use ephemeral build nodes in your CI that all, always are kind of clean and have to pull the images. Then it becomes super expensive. So 
I can't really answer this in a, in a perfect way. It really depends on the use case and where is the pain point. So you can solve it a little bit with the image cache from Docker. This helps. Uh, ramp up time is similar thing. It's most of the time a trade uh, a trade off. So if the ramp up, like the expensive point is putting in the test data, for example, into the image, you can solve this by doing it one time somewhere, committing this, having then a special image you use for your tests. So then this might be faster. However, now you have to ship around those image layers. And if you don't have a cache for the image layers, this becomes expensive again, maybe more expensive than inserting the test data every time. Yeah, so the test containers can't solve this actually. Um, with regards to startup time, Docker and test containers could solve this once Docker would support container checkpoints on all operation systems, which they don't currently. So Docker supports checkpoints, container checkpoints on a special Linux kernel. And this allows you to do a checkpoint of a running container instance, including the memory state. So you can then have a checkpoint from the already running Oracle instance. And restoring this check checkpoint is at least in all the stuff when we tried it out is a, a, a question of milliseconds. So in this case, you can run all your tests. You can always jump back to the other checkpoint and so on. It would be extremely fast, especially if you have the container running and just jump back to the checkpoint all the time. But this experimental kernel features are not enabled, so they are part of Creo in the Linux kernel. They are not enabled on Docker for Mac and on Docker for Windows, since they bring their own Linux kernels in their distributions. And I honestly don't know why Docker is not pushing this topic, because they had this feature as experimental feature, I think, since 2018. Okay. So maybe it needs some more love in this area, but as I know, it, it's a it's a pain for, for some people working for big enterprises, but maybe, yeah, using something like Postgres or MySQL or whatever is like way, way faster. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, we have two more questions in, in the in the Q&A. And um, Michael asked already like long time ago, how does Cypress compare to Selenium in your experience? Um, I don't have personal experience with Cypress, but uh, a friend of mine and former colleague from CodeCentric, uh, Andreas, um, he used it or, or used it, I think, for their internal tests. He uses test containers together with Cypress. And um, I think he's super happy and he says Cypress is much better as Selenium, but I, I can't comment on it. But I know you can combine it with test container. And yeah, maybe also because you mentioned it before, and that you have like a container for Selenium. Maybe it's yeah, you can you can probably use the same container because the Selenium container we have is the Selenium image from Docker Hub that contains a browser like Chrome and Firefox mm -hmm. and the Selenium web driver. But so I don't know how Cypress is instrumented. So if it's instrumented over the web driver, you can use the same one. If it's instrument over something else, maybe a JavaScript include, I don't know. But you can probably still use our browser web driver container because it is still a good wrapper around a browser in a container. Yeah. Yeah, and Matthias made like a comment or a question. Local tests, including micro eight or Minikube would be cool, right? So. That goes also in the direction of Kubernetes running like actually locally. Yeah, so maybe, maybe, but um, so none of us has actually that much involvement with Kubernetes. So therefore it's never went onto our plate. And um, uh, I think it will work like for this 80% quite quickly. And then people are maybe happy about this, but to this 100% where the networks behave similar, where the volume stuff behave similar, uh, it's probably a long way to go. And then 
I don't know, I feel unhappy with test containers supporting these different environments where some of them are not really there. So we all up on, sometimes see those pull requests uh, where they have some kind of uh, extreme proof of concept that kind of works, but it just works in those green cases kind of in the happy path. Mm -hmm. And then also probably setting up infrastructure to, to run this integration or integrated tests uh, is then also quite a lot of effort and also maintaining that and keeping it up to date and supporting different versions and so on. Um, can, can imagine. Very true. So it's already a real, a real big pain to uh, support Windows CI now. <laughs> uh, it took us a long time and we run our own server now, which is running at Sergey's home. Uh, that is our Windows build node that we then have integrated with GitHub Actions because it's not that easy finding a free or even non-free CI system that supports Docker for Windows in the way we need it. So you find Windows CI nodes, but then they would not support Docker back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it had, has to do, of course, with how they run their Windows CI. They already run it in Hyper-V then they can't have the initial Hyper-V instance. So this, these things can maybe change now with WSL2, I'm not sure. But you're right, uh, having CI for all those kind of um, environments is quite painful also. Um, there was one note in the chat from Werner regarding the Docker image for Oracle, which I found uh, very interesting. He says, you still can get the Oracle instance down to three gigabytes. So um, thanks for the note. Um, yeah. So if, a lot. so if if you would be able to uh, provide a GitHub repository for the three gigabyte image, I think the community would be super happy, and I would also try to incorporate it in test containers. Um, yeah, but I imagine you say the DBA had to do it. Yeah, this is like the old school Oracle DBA stuff to fiddle around. I, I, yes, yes. So it would be amazing. So this is the point where I'm still, uh, why I'm still not um, uh, touched the Oracle integration part because I don't want it to build the image myself or clean up the old image. And I wanted to also ideally have a Docker file that does it kind of to use the Docker hub build for the image because the only way I could do it before myself was I, I build and run the image locally. I then execute commands in the image or in the running container and then commit the container. But that's of course not cool. So if we find a way to produce an automated image uh, that is three gigabyte, like the whole Java community would be super happy, I think. But do you need to have all the features, right? So that will be difficult, actually. It's not just garbage in there, I think. But... <laughs> yes, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, um, because now I see that people are dropping out, I, I would close the session and also mention a few things again. So if you're fine with that, or just like you have the last seconds for questions, and then, yeah. <laughs> All these, um, all these inputs in the chat, nice to read. So yes, thanks a lot, Kevin, for your presentation. I really loved it. It was like a, a really nice approach. And I will remember the double brackets um, <laughs> actually in the code. I have never seen that before. And I think I will remember it. I will keep it just for my tests. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we also have support in the background, as you know, Ursula is doing the administration, Marcos is helping out with all the technical things, and we'll also do the cutting and the, the publishing to YouTube afterwards. And also big thanks to our sponsors, um, which actually allow us to run all these sessions. And last but not least, actually, thank you very much, Kevin and for your presentation and i missed a bit the toblerones because i think it was just like on the first slide but it never popped up but regarding this there is one question do you know where the beer is in the in the logo of the toblerone a beer there, there is a beer yeah and bear, oh. uh, bear. So you closely you will probably see him actually in the in the matterhorn ah. so that 
own thing which is hidden actually in the Toblerone. So maybe Perfect. next time you get one, you will see it and you will always remember it because I think it's a it's cool gimmick they built it. So yes, thank you very much and let's hope we can see each other soon again. And yes. provide us, dear participants, your feedback. You will be directly forwarded to the feedback form. We would be really happy to have this and also share afterwards with um, Kevin. Thanks a lot and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Happy hacking. <laughs>